The unit we're going to start covering is a unit on ecology. Uh, in terms of the way that you would study for this, it's a lot of vocabulary, very similar to evolution. And through those words, I'm going to give you some examples. They may not be the exact example you would see on an exam, but at least it gives you one good solid piece of, of evidence to kind of go on a term so that you can then apply it to a new situation. When someone asks you that we're studying ecology, I guess we should start with what it is. And in terms of the way that these notes will go, I'm not really going to write anything. It's just going to speed this process up. If I try and type in or write, uh, it's going to slow it down. You have the option of obviously pausing if you didn't hear something or slowing it down by just pressing pause and, and rejoining when you need to. But the ecology uh, unit is going to study interactions between organisms, both interactions between living things, such as two organisms and how they interact, but also how an organism interacts with its non-living components that surround it. So ecology really is the study of interactions between organisms and both the living and non-living components of their environment. And humans obviously impact the environment greatly. Over the past few decades, humans have caused major changes to our environment. I'm sure we can go through a laundry list of things that we have done, both in a good aspect but also a negative aspect. I think this unit unfortunately focuses on that negative aspect of human population growth. And here we have on the right hand side a exponential growth curve it seems. You've seen these potentially in math where things start out relatively slow growing. On the y-axis we have the population that's going to be in the billions of people and some of the years are are kind of mentioned here. It's not every certain number of years but uh you know, going back into the 1600s, we had a half a billion people, and for a long period of time we had that. Um, and we'll talk about why there might be such a growth. And you can see here this, this is a little outdated in terms of where it ends with 2011. But I think current numbers have the human population growth being around uh, 7 billion people. We reached 6 billion, which was a, a milestone, I remember, back in, uh, I think, 1999. So... The human population growth is exploding, and the prediction is that we're going to cap off somewhere. We can't go in this rate forever. So there is a cap that they're thinking might happen around the 10 billion mark, maybe 12 billion if we're lucky. And if you can think of reasons why, there has to be a cap. Humans rely on things such as food, space for even waste, you know, and, and energy sources. So those are all things that relate to human population and the explosion of it. With the influx of humans into the world, unfortunately things have to go and that's what extinction is. And We talked about some organisms that have gone extinct. Over here on the right hand side we have a, a snippet of the geologic timeline. If you recognize Paleozoic as being one of the eras that came before the Mesozoic and if you recall, do you remember what the name of this era is? That is the Cenozoic era. And there is a spike. As you can see on this graph, again, it's a lot of interpretation of data. There is a, the y-axis is the families per millions of years, so the extinction rate. And so what you would see is families would be under the, uh, like the kingdom, phylum, class. So think of that. A family is one of those uh, levels. And so you can see that there were five peaks where there were a lot of families going away. And with that goes extinction. So we had five major portions. Um, a lot of times this could be environmental. Maybe there was a sudden change in the environment. Um, maybe there was a, um, you know, from cold to hot, hot to cold. Maybe there was something that struck Earth. We have no idea. Like that would be something you would probably look into a little bit more detail. That's not something we're going to cover. But what we're saying now is that we're in the sixth mass extinction. But this one would be caused because of the human growth. So some stats that we have. Um, since humans arrived, for example, there have been about 60% of the native birds in Hawaii have become extinct. They were doing just fine before we got there. And what they predict is about 20% of today's species may disappear in the next century. I mentioned the other day about the rhino and saying how there is only one, I think I was corrected at one point, but it was the white rhino is down to one male and two females. In the future of this video scene, I don't know where that would be, but current day on May 3rd, 2017, 
We had one male white rhino and two females, and they are still trying to figure out how to progress that species and repopulate it. The next thing we have here are some environmental things that can affect the people around us. We have the thinning ozone. We probably have a background on the ozone layer. Um, some students have misconceptions of the ozone layer. They, they often equate ozone layer with climate change in terms of um, global warming. The thinning ozone is really not the direct, um, I guess, the direct factor that is causing global warming. The ozone layer, which you can see here in this picture, there is a opening in the ozone layer. Ozone is actually O3. That's the chemical formula. So oxygen is O2. Ozone is O3. It is a renewable source. You can actually, not, it will be made, it will be replenished, but we are just depleting it at a higher rate than it can be replenished. So it's thinning. And what does it do and why is it important? The ozone layer is specifically there to absorb UV radiation from the sun. So UV radiation is detrimental to the health of many things, including yourself. Uh, it can cause cancer. So things that humans impacted were these things called CFCs. That's an abbreviation for something called chlorofluorocarbon, but it's more often just abbreviated CFCs. And these were chemicals, and they destroyed ozone. They were banned back in the 90s, but prior to that, they were plentiful in a lot of aerosol cans and hairsprays and things like that. So we were really not too aware of this fact, and due to that, the ozone layer, which ironically is hovered around Antarctica, um, began to thin and deplete. And what that's going to do is allow more UV radiation to reach us. And so we can kind of think of the UV index. If you ever read the paper, you kind of get that UV index per day. I, you know, I might look at that in the summer if you're going to the beach. And that's going to dictate how much sunscreen you have to wear. So the ozone layer, that's its purpose. As opposed to the, the greenhouse effect, this is global warming. So it's a big thing in the news, global warming, global warming, global warming. So global warming is a natural thing. We actually want the ability to have the earth have this thing called the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is a mechanism that insulates earth from the deep freezes of space. If we didn't have this insulation, we would freeze. So what we do, there are certain gases on this planet that have a great ability to absorb energy, to absorb heat. And not all molecules have the, the great ability, but one of the most common and controversial molecules is carbon dioxide. So CO2 is known as a greenhouse gas because a greenhouse gas is any gas that has the ability to absorb this energy. And when it absorbs that energy, it holds on to that heat like a blanket around us. So if we have more CO2 in the atmosphere, you can make the assumption that it has a better ability of holding heat. So think of things that put CO2 into the atmosphere. Burning of fossil fuels, cars. Humans, again, have an impact on CO2 production. Other ways is thinking about how does CO2 stay in the atmosphere? We can fix the greenhouse effect if we get rid of CO2 from the atmosphere. We've learned through photosynthesis that CO2 is removed by plants. But if we are cutting down trees, we are cutting down the ability for CO2 to be absorbed by a plant. So therefore, CO2 stays in the atmosphere for longer. So those are two aspects. We have to look at both spectrums of how to prevent CO2 from going into the atmosphere at a higher than normal rate, or how do we increase it from to get it out of the atmosphere. So those are things to think about. It's not the only greenhouse gas. The other common greenhouse gas is methane, so cows. Cows release methane every time they, they fart. Well, any anytime anybody farts, it's going to release that. And there are statistics out there about how many cows are, are in this world and how much we actually need and cut down trees to feed these plants, to feed these cows. So this is a, why some people actually change their diet because they know that 
consuming meat products, unfortunately, is keeping that business afloat. And so there are a lot of things that we can do, but you have to make conscious efforts to um, help the process. So the next thing, we have levels of organization. Up until this point, we've been very, very molecular. We started this year talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons, and going up to atoms, then making our way up to cells. Then we learned and already knew that cells, when they work together, they produce tissues. Tissues produce organs. Organs produce organ systems, and organ systems produce organisms. Now we take it to the next level. So now we're in ecology. So this is a continuation of that same step, 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 all the way up to organism. Levels of organization beyond the organism start when, when organisms work together. They are called a population. So if you want to put definitions here, populations are members of the same species that live in one place at one time. So you can broaden that population to be city populations, state populations. You define what the place is at that particular moment. The next step is communities. And communities are when multiple species of organisms live together in an area. So think of a community that you are in. You look around you, you see plants, you see other animals. Those are all organisms that are within your community. Oak, maple, those are your trees that are in your community. The third level is the ecosystem. And an ecosystem is taking everything prior to it, so that's all of the different organisms, but the ecosystem takes into account the non-living components around you. So that might be, are you in a water ecosystem? So over here on the right hand side is a picture that shows an ecosystem. How do I know this is showing an ecosystem? Because what it has, it's a small area. You're going to see in the next one, a biome is a much larger area. So this picture isn't showing a biome. An ecosystem could be small. This could be a pond. But what you see here are non-living components. You see a lot of living, fish, um, turtle, you know, you see the trees. So they give you a plethora of living things, but they also show you the non-living things. You can also consider, um, you know, the soil that might not be seen here, but is understood to be there. That's all part of your ecosystem. When you take a broader uh, look at more ecosystems, you take a biome. So a biome is a large area that has similar living and non-living components. You may have never heard of the term biome, but you've heard of examples of biomes, such as deserts, tundras, tropical rainforests. Those are all examples of biomes. They cover massive areas, and within there, you can kind of predict things. We're going to do a lot more detail. I'm going to have you research more biomes because that's an important thing for this chapter as well as for the Keystone to recognize what are within these areas. So you, I think, come to the table knowing deserts are dry. Tropical rainforests are large amounts of precipitation. But the other things are typical organisms that you might see there. Those are things you'll be learning about in the future. And then we have our biggest, most inclusive level of organization that's called a biosphere. So a biosphere is the area of Earth along with its atmosphere that supports life. So this not only covers the land that you live on, but it covers the atmosphere in which the birds fly in, and it covers the depths of the water where living things can still survive. So the biosphere is everything where anyone or anything can live. Okay. So I'm going to stop there with this first day, and then what I'll do is I'm going to pick up the next thing and uh, make sure you continue with these videos.